Thank you so much for being here today. <clears throat> it's a special day. I thank the Board of Directors for having me again. I enjoy sharing unity. It's always a special church, a special, it's more than a church, it's a family. And I love that. Uh, for years, I attended the unity in New York with Eric Butterworth and sat there and just took notes. You think they were giving tests. <laughs> but uh, it was such an awesome teaching and life changing. And uh, as a result of that, I think I can share some of what I received from him and that being a start for where we are now. I know a little about my style. I love to, uh, I believe in the mastermind principle that whatever we create here today, we did it together. So if you go home and say, oh, he was a terrible speaker, it's your fault. <laughs> 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 my little thing here. My daughter always wonders, she said, Dad, what do you do for a living? I said, good question. <laughs> well, I love speaking. I love sharing the message that, uh, and it's a message that we, we live it together. It's, you know, I, I like to talk in the we, because whatever happens to us happens to all of us. So I believe in the mastermind principle, and so we like to get interaction. We uh, when two or more gathered on one accord, I am, the making power is among them. And so the making power is here today, and whatever happens, we all did it together. Fair enough? Yeah. I like to use the power of, uh, you might say, call and response. Because with the more of your senses you can get involved with the learning process, the more that you retain. So if I say, um, can I have an amen, what do we say? Amen! amen. And if I say, how do you feel today? You say, great. How do you feel today? Great. Let's do love. How do you feel today? Great. Love. Let's try it again. <laughs> how do you feel today? Love. You know, it's funny. You feel the vibrations in your body? That's all a part of the learning process. I also use affirmations. You know, the affirmation, the law of commands is whatsoever you say, you get it. Your word never returns to you void. So don't say anything you don't mean. The subconscious mind does not take a joke. So only say good things about yourself. So I feel great today. Let's say that together. I feel great today. One of my favorite affirmations each day is to get up and look in the mirror and say, I am beautiful through and through. Let's try that together. I am beautiful through and through. Sometimes you want to wiggle a little bit. <laughs> you find it, you, you walk out of your house with a whole different thing. So let's try that again with a little wiggle. I am beautiful through and through. Yeah. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> wow. So the message really, everything, you know, in life happens for a purpose. That uh, when I was in Israel, studying there, one of the things that got you really get to feel about the Bible is that the Bible is really your own personal success book. It's almost like your personal driver's guide. And so everybody in the Bible is you. You're Jesus, you're God, you're Satan, you're Moses. Everything in the Bible is about some aspect of us. And so when we use that, we can use the Bible as a guide to help us get from where we are to where we want to be. And so today, our message is, it's taken from Luke chapter 15, 15 chapter, the 11th through the 32nd verses, and it's called the prodigal son. And I thought of it for this time of year because, you know, at the end of each year, we sort of figure how do we get where we are? <laughs> you know, where did the year go? We start finding some of our old uh, notes for what we want to accomplish this year, and we go, wow, sure missed the mark on that one. <laughs> and so the prodigal son is really about, I call it the journey home, how to get back to where you should be, how to get to where you really ought to be. And so just to give a quick overview of the, of the scripture, you know, it says that a certain man had two sons, of course, and in the Bible there's always that duality that yin-yang, that emotion, that rational. You know, 
It says that a man shall have whatsoever he thinks in his heart. There are two aspects of everything, emotion and rationality. And so the two sons represent certain things. The younger son, and it's always the younger one. You notice the older son never does anything. <laughs> you know, Jacob and Esau is the younger son that caused the problems. The younger son decided he wanted his inheritance. He said, give me my share and let me get out of here. And that's exactly what he did. He went into the far country, and the far country is anywhere. It's not a geographical place. The far country most often is right in here. It's a journey from a journey of thinking. He said, I want to leave my father's house, and the father's house represents a certain mode of thinking. You know, we all, when you live in your father's house, you have to live by your father's rules. And so all of us come to that point in life where we want to get out of there. So the young man wanted to get out of there, and he went to the far country. And as they say, he spent his life in riotous living. We call it wine, women, and song. <laughs> in New York, they say, he spent his life with uh, fast women and slow horses. <laughs> and then there came a time when he was broke. There's something about living the, the feeling nature that it always expands you. Somehow when your feeling is un, undirected by rationality, it, 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 it just burns you and consumes you. So he ends up broke. There's a famine in the land. And he, as he said, nobody cares. We get that place in our lives sometimes where we have a personal famine and it looks like nobody cared. Sometimes you share your, 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 your misery with somebody and half the people don't care and the other half glad is you. <laughs> but there comes a point where in that suffering he says, when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and I perish with hunger? You see, he's taken a job. <laughs> Many of us do that. <laughs> when, when, when our fortune runs out, we take a job. And it's funny, it's never a job we love. His job was feeding the pigs. And so he got an opportunity. Everything is about opportunity and growth. He got an opportunity to eat what the pigs didn't want. He was not happy. But when he came to himself and he recognized his one ship with his father, he says, he says, I will arise and go to my father, and unto him I will say, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But and he arose and he started home, and when the father saw him from a great distance, and that means that the moment you decide to go home, the moment you decide to realign yourself with your God consciousness, God operates immediately. God has no sense of time. It's always now. The only time for God is now. We can't see it, but it's always now. And when he was a great way off, the father came and had compassion and fell and kissed him on the neck and said, get the fatted calf. He put him on, gave him a new robe. And a robe is that sense of protection. Gave him a new ring, that sense of where he belonged, that sense of friend. You know, in other words, you know, like if you notice, the kings always have rings. The pope has a ring. So when he gave him a ring, it's like acknowledging that you are once again in the family. And then he gave him shoes. Shoes always represent understanding, a new thought. I need a new thought. Let's say that together. I need a new thought. So with that new thought now, the, uh, the party's going on, and lo and behold, the older son, and the older sons always get the bad end of it. The older son hears all the partying, and nobody invited him. Nobody told him what's going on. He came, and he wouldn't even go in the house, and he says, you know, what's going on? The servant said, they're having a party for your brother, your brother who was lost is now found. Your brother who was dead is now alive. And the older son said, and they didn't invite me. He said, I've been here all along. I did everything my father said. He never had a party for me. He never invited my friends. He was angry. The 
father came out and begged him to come on inside. And the father, the son really didn't want to go. The father said, your brother who was dead is now alive, who was lost is now found. The father's giving a principle to him that it's almost like the lost sheep. But people, they, they say the shepherd would leave a hundred sheep to go find the one that's lost and then rejoice when they find that one. That's the essence of God. In other words, everybody is so important that just one salvation, one person coming back into the fold means rejoice. So let's look at this. What is the lesson of, of, of the parable of the prodigal son? It's really a parable about ego, choice, separation, and resolution. We are each the prodigal son. We are each the prodigal son. We have always made choices that take us either to heaven or to the other place. We often say, you don't want to say it because, you know, the, the law of command said, whatsoever you say, if you have, so let's just go to the other <laughs> How do you know your life is out of order? How do you know that you're in the promised land? And the clue is, you know, life needs clues. And the clue is that you're unhappy, depressed, stressed out, disappointed. You know, if we're not reaching our own expectations, we're in the promise. We, no, not the promised land. We're in a far country. Excuse me, the promised land is a good place. How do you know you're in the far country when you're not happy? Every one of us experiences unhappiness with our condition. At the end of the year, especially when you see that you did not fulfill your expectations, all the things you wrote out that you wanted to do, be and have, and lo and behold, 12 months have happened and you're still in the far country. How do you get to the far country? It begins with a decision. We are where we are because of the decisions we make. I am where I am because of the decisions I make. Let's say that together. I am where I am because of the decisions I make. When this young son decided he wanted his fortune and to go out into the country, that changed the deal. And whatever you decide, it creates a whole new reality for yourself. It's also about ego. What makes you decide to leave the father's house? Because you think you know what you're doing. <laughs> you ever think, man, my parents are dumber than a box of rocks. <laughs> they don't know anything. Yeah, I know your kids have told you. They'll tell you that in a minute. You don't know anything. I got you here. <laughs> your feet are under my table. But ego, that part of us that says that we know and when we want to substitute our judgment for what we know is right. That's what takes us off the path. That's what takes us to the far country. Ego is that emotional force that drives our decisions. So let's look. A little further. What's the lesson of the prodigal son? Let's go straight there. And the lesson of the prodigal son is one that it's about separation. That when you leave your father's house, there are two separations. One, separation from God. Separation from your source. When you become separate from your source, you're out of step. Stuff doesn't work. You say, well, how do you get separated from your source whenever you waste your gifts? You see, the father gave the son his gifts, his treasures, and he wasted them. So if we waste our gifts, our talents, I guarantee you everyone in this room has a talent that you've not used. Everyone in this room has a gift that you've really not honored. For whatever reason. But that's key. We all have great gifts, and when we separate ourselves from our source, we don't use them properly. It's also about separation from self. You know, we often say, well, I, I raised that kid, I know how he is.
But the weirdest thing you ever know is you have two kids, same house, same family, same food, and you almost want to do a DNA. <laughs> <laughs> How could they be so different? I mean, it's amazing. And it's because God has created each one of us different. Two seeds are absolutely different. There's a reason why there are no two fingerprints that are the same. Because each of us is a different representation of God. We are all spiritual beings having a physical existence. We are all representations of God. And boy, we can take God through some stuff. <laughs> the fellow used to tell a story and he said, you know, He's driving at 85 miles an hour. And God says, man, you better slow down. He said, it's okay. God is with me. <laughs> when he hit 100, he still, he said, man, you better slow down. It's okay. God is with me. He said, no, man, God got out back there when you hit 85. <laughs> <laughs> so this whole idea of separation fits into what we call the stages of life. And in our book, we talk about the four stages of life. The first stage is education, and that's where we are children, where we learn from our parents what we need to do. The second stage is sensation. That's where we learn about love, about drugs, about things that titillate the senses. Many of us get stuck in that second stage. You know, there, there are often people who never get past that second stage because they are controlled by their appetite. The, the second stage requires that you develop self-discipline. Without death, there's a saying that says, he who lives without discipline dies without dignity. You can be president of the United States, and if you don't have discipline, what do they remember about Bill Clinton? <laughs> has nothing to do with what it's those, those, those little things. That make the difference. So that age of experience is one that we have to master. The third stage of life is the stage of power. When you got it all together. When you master your appetites. When you're in control. The fourth stage of life is the stage of immortality. When you're concerned about what your life stood for. You know, it, it's not how long you live, but it's what you contributed to life that makes the difference. And so the, the, the parable of the, of the prodigal son is really about that second stage because that's the one that gets most of us. That's the one that gets us stuck. And so let's look at this. What's the lesson of the prodigal son? Well, the first lesson is this, awareness. You can't change it if you're not aware of the situation. If you're in pain, if you're in that far country suffering, and you're not aware, you'll never change. Why don't people become aware? It's called denial. Many of us can be in bad situations and we deny it. We pretend that everything is okay. Oh, they don't mean it. They didn't know. Oh, we've seen it. I mean, terrible situations where denial will keep you in the far country. So, awareness of our condition. Once we become aware, we neutralize denial, and we can go on the path to healing. The second lesson is that <laughs> we must take responsibility. You know, awareness, when it says, I'm aware of my relationship with God, with the Creator, that then puts you in a different place. But once you're aware of it, now you got to do something. And that second, that idea of taking responsibility, if you don't take responsibility for your success or your failures, you can never grow. The prodigal son could have blamed everybody. He could have blamed God for the famine. He could have blamed his father. You didn't give me enough. You cheated me with my inheritance. If I had more money, I'd have made it. He could have blamed some of the people that he interacted with. And so that second, that second lesson of the prodigal son is we have to take responsibility, eliminate blame. Whatever it is, we did it. Wherever we are in life, I put myself here. Wherever I am in life, I put myself there. Let's say that together. Wherever I am in life, I put myself there. 
Because once you recognize that now, you can fix it. You can't fix it if you don't own up to it. If it's somebody else's fault, then it's in their power to change it. If we're going to fix it, we've got to take responsibility. In the scripture it says, he came to himself, recognizing that he was the son of God, the son of a great father, the son of a great person. And then the third principle is, he took action. See, once you come to yourself and recognize that you are a representation of God, of the God principle, then you're a different person. I mean, <laughs> you can't be God and be ungodly. And so that begins to order your steps. Once you've decided that, you have to take action. See, every decision leads to action. If it, if it doesn't lead to action, it's not really a decision, it's just an idea. But when it leads to action, that's what brings about the change. The prodigal said, son said, I will arise and go to my father. That means that I've acknowledged now that I'm in a hole. I've acknowledged now that there's a source outside of myself, and I've made a commitment to change. Is there anything you'd like to change in your life? Is there any condition that you've created that's a far country in your mind that you don't want to continue? Just think about that. When he acknowledges his shortcomings, he confesses his sins, we'll call them his shortcomings, and then he asks forgiveness. You remember he says, he says, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of thy servants. Many times when we come back from a far country, we come back with an agenda. One of my sons, he'll be in here hit the biggest hole when he'll come back and try to explain to me why it was a good thing. <laughs> you ever have those kids that want to borrow money from you and you told them you were going to lose money, you told them the thing was going to fail, and then it failed and they come back. They want to borrow some more money. You say, well, I told you it was going to fail. Why, why should I loan you some more? You don't understand. You here borrowing money from me? <laughs> it's all about truth. You got to really see your condition. Once we can overcome denial and blame, we can start to see our condition. When you come back, you have to come back with an open. We say, come as a, the little children. I was looking at the kids. They don't have a sense. You know, you, you look at kids, and then you look at ourselves and say, man, how did they get messed up? <laughs> <laughs> because of their thinking and the decisions. And so once he arose, once he saw above his present condition, we get out of our situation by seeing beyond where we are. We often say we have to see beyond our limitations to our possibilities. We may be broke, we may be stuck, but that's not where we're supposed to be. We don't have to stay stuck in the promised land, in, 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 the, in the far country. We want to stay stuck in the promised land. The fourth lesson is confirmation. The moment you come back into the fold, God rushes to recognize. Father didn't ask where he'd been, didn't ask why he came back. And we do that when our kids come back, when our friends come back, when people come back into our lives, they just need us to love them and treat them like the kings and queens they really are. And so that fourth, that fourth lesson of confirmation, it says to you, when I come back, I know I'll be received. You don't have to wonder about that because you are the creation, the manifestation of the God consciousness. So the moment you recognize that and start heading home, it's automatic. The fourth principle, the fifth principle is this. You know, when you read the Prodigal Son, the, 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 the last portion is not that clear at first. The, the older son had a point. I mean, he stayed, he worked, he did his share, but nobody gave him a party. And so the fifth principle is law. God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter what you did last week. It's now. 
It's always now. So when the when the oldest son heard about the party, he got jealous. That was his far country. Jealousy. And then once again, the father came out to meet him and asked him to come in, but he was still jealous. So the oldest son has his own far country to deal with, jealousy. And the father says, listen, any time your brother who was dead is alive and who was lost is found, is a time to rejoice. Has nothing with what you did last week. Has nothing with what you'll do tomorrow. But in the now, it's about accepting him and loving him. So these are the principles, I think, that have really led us to help us find our far country. All of us have a far country. We may not share it with other people, but we know what it is. For us to recognize where we are and to come back into the fold. And so let's go over those, the five principles, the five lessons of the prodigal son. The first, awareness of being. Let's say that together. Awareness of being. Each of us is the manifested existence of the God mind. Second principle, I take responsibility for my condition together. I take responsibility for my condition. The third principle, I take action for change together. I take action for change. And the fourth principle is, it's already done together. It's already done. And then that fifth principle is, there is only now together. There is only now. And so the choice is always up to us. We can create a far country in our lives by denial and by blame. Or we can create the promised land where our dreams, where our desires, and where our hopes come true. It's always in our hands. The decisions we make determine the lives we live. So it is, it cannot be otherwise, and we rejoice 